So today I thought I'd show you exactly how I go about duping products um, and I'm going to take you through that in a spreadsheet and there is also a free digital download which you can get from my website and I'll link that below. Um, I hope this helps a lot of you um, let's get on with it. <music> Okay, hopefully you can hear me okay, and um, this is being done over my laptop speaker. Um, I'm going to take you through the spreadsheet that I've made. This is a free digital download that you can get from the link in the description below. Um, what I've done is I've got these three tabs at the bottom. The first one tells you how to use it, uh, sort of how to dupe a product. The second tab, um, this is my example I'm going to use today, uh, this will all be empty for you. This is where you will input all the information about the product you want to dupe. And then the final tab is where you'll put your formula. So we're going to start off with this product that I'll cut to now. I'm using this Palmer's Sheer Butter Body Lotion as an example, and we're going to scroll down and then just find the ingredients and we're going to copy and paste these into our spreadsheet. So from that, um, I've taken all of the ingredients and I've listed them in the order they appear in this column here. That's everything that was on that label. Then what I do is I then have this column for function and I will search for the ingredients on the internet or on uh, either on Google or on supplier websites that I use. And I'll look at the information they give about the product. And I'll specifically put the function of the product in this column. Function being how it uh, benefits the skin basically. For instance, shea butter here is a humectant, it softens and hydrates the skin and it also helps the texture of the final product. And then cetyl alcohol, for example, is a thickener, it's moisturising and it adds to the overall skin feel of the product. You want to be writing the function down because this is useful if you have to make substitutions or you need to omit an ingredient. You know what it does so that you can make best guess substitutions. The next column is the official recommended or maximum usage rate. You can also get this on the supplier website or you can just quickly Google shea butter recommended usage rate isopropyl myristrate recommended usage rate and normally something will come up for you. Put that here and then you have basically given yourself a guide for how much of that can be used in that product. In the next column you want to add notes about how it goes into the formula. So is it oil soluble or water soluble? Um, is it tolerant in certain temperatures or certain pH ranges. If you've got emulsifiers or surfactants, what charge are they? Um, if one is cationic, you want to make sure that any substitutions you make are compatible with that, etc. So anything of note about that ingredient goes in the how to use column. Then we get on to figuring it all out. So how do you do this? Basically, you look at where the ingredients fall in their ingredients list and the recommended usage rate. And this will give you a way to sort of best guess what percentage they've used that ingredient at in the formula based on where it falls and the recommended usage rates. Now, the best way to start this off is always leave water till last because that will just be the remaining percentage to make up to 100 after you've done everything else. What you need to do is look for ingredients that you recognize first of all, or ones that you know are typically used at a low percentage. I usually start with preservatives. So this keeps snapping, sorry. Um, so we know ethyl hexyl glycerin is a preservative 
and phenoxyethanol is a preservative. They've also got other preservatives here. This means that they have created their own preservative system. When you're first making cosmetics, I don't recommend doing this. You're not in a lab environment. You don't have the experience to balance them. So I'd use an all-in-one broad spectrum preservative. Um, we recognize the names phenoxyethanol and ethyl hexoglycerin because that is basically combining those two gives you uh, your phenoxyethanol EHG preservative, which is a broad spectrum preservative usually used at around 1%. So we can replace immediately all of the preservatives with that one broad spectrum preservative. And we know that that's used at around 1%. Most preservatives will make up 1% to 2% in total anyway. Um, so that gives you sort of a line where ingredients will be around that level. Let's look for other ingredients we recognise. Uh, cetyl alcohol can be used up to 25%, but based on where it falls and the likely usage for it, and you don't want to thicken the product too much because this is a lotion we're making, I would estimate it's used at around 2%. So I'm going to put my 2% in there. That means that everything below that 2% above the preservative is going to be between 2 and 1%. Anything above that will be above 2%. So next I'm going to look at something else I recognise, tocopherol, your vitamin E. Now typically this is used in very small amounts uh, in products. I have a feeling in this it's probably around 2% inclusion. Um, I tend to use it at less so I'm actually going to include it at 0.2% because I find that's enough and I've also read evidence to suggest that that is enough to gain the benefits from it. Then I'm looking at things like uh, the shea butter and the oils. Obviously they can be used up to any amount, so it's kind of best guess with that. So I'm going to look at the ingredients below it, such as isopropyl myristrate and propylene glycol. So these two have a usage rate that can be quite high, um, but normally they're around three to five percent. So I'm going to make a best guess at 4% for isopropyl myristate and 3% for propylene glycol. Then I know that anything above that will be higher than 4%. Now, because it's a lotion, you don't really want it to be too high with the butter and the oil because you'll make a really thick product. So this is kind of where I'm placing them, the sort of five to seven percent range but it's really up to you you need to experiment with this because with oils it's quite hard to determine if they come up quite high because they could literally be anything as could the water so you can tailor this a bit to how you want it and add as much oil or as wa much water as you like to get a good balance for the texture of the products you want to make. But based on the texture of the product I'm trying to make, I think that's probably about right. It's about using your best judgment, really. Then we go down, we'll see some ingredients that we can't get hold of, like uh, palmitic acid. Now, this is a nice ingredient. It helps to smooth skin and reduce the appearance of blemishes. It helps to prevent water loss and improve product texture. However, it's quite hard to find, but it is found in beeswax, which can have similar properties. That can also help to thicken products and smooth skin. So you could use beeswax as a substitute, or you could omit it, because we do also have steric acid, which is a texture enhancer and emollient, and can have slightly similar properties although obviously not the same so I think we'll just omit that and keep our steric acid. So moving down aloe vera we recognize because that's quite low down and we've calculated our steric acid is probably around 1.5 percent we know that the aloe vera is going to be lower than that so we're going to put that around one percent the other oils, I don't see the point of adding oils in less than 1%, so I'm going to keep them at 1%. 
This particular one I couldn't find, so I'm going to omit it. It's an oil, it'll have its own benefit, but it won't really matter if you take it out. And then we've got oatmeal extract. I did manage to find this, but it's extremely expensive. So you have two options here. You can either buy the extremely expensive ingredient and include it, although there's no inclusion information, so it would be a best guess, and I'd say probably around half a percent. Or you can omit it and replace it with colloidal oats. These would go in the water phase as colloidal oats dissolve in water. Don't confuse them with oatmeal flour, it's different. You can use this to about 5%, but I'm going to use about 1%. It has different benefits, but it does have nice benefits and I think it goes with the overall theme of the product. So that's what I'm going to use instead of the extract. Then obviously your scent. Fragrance here, I think, based where it's placed is going to be 1% or less. And then you've got your emulsifiers. Now they're using their own emulsifying system here. It's very difficult to balance these if you're a beginner. So what I'd suggest is finding all of the emulsifiers, omit them completely unless you can find all of them and guess the percentages well, and replace it with an all-in-one emulsifier that you like at around 20 to 25 percent of the total oil ingredients. I'm going to use BTMS 50. I like the skin feel of it. It's a cationic emulsifier so do make sure your ingredients are compatible if you substitute anything. Then we back down here with our preservatives. Sodium hydroxide is listed. Uh, this is a pH adjuster, likely at around half a percent, um, but we'll include that at half a percent, but we'll have to do our own testing to find that exact level at the end of making this. Tetrasodium EDTA is a chelating agent. It helps to stabilise the product and it aids the efficacy of the preservative. It's a bit hard to get in the UK, but a good alternative is sodium phytate, which you can use at about 0.5%. So I've put that in there. Then you get down to the bottom and all of these, hopefully some of you should recognise, they're just fragrance allergens. They're the the ingredients that make up fragrances to make them smell the way they do. Um, so obviously you have to list these by law uh, in the UK, but they're not actual ingredients you have to include in your product because they're within whatever fragrance you use, so you can happily ignore them. So now you've got these best guesses in this, you now need to put them in a formula. Hi, Editing Jenna here, sponsoring my own video. If you'd like to learn more about duping products and formulating in general, then I've created a formulation basics course. It's designed for beginners and it goes through all the basic knowledge to get you started making your own products, either for yourself or for sale. It includes 16 formulas to follow and is both full of information in slide and video format. Uh, it comes with a 169 page PDF ebook download and lifetime access to updates and additions. The runtime of the course, including video demos, is around five hours total and it's very affordable. Plus, if you uh, enter code YouTube10 at checkout, you'll get 10% off. Um, the link to that is in the description below. Now back to the video. So I've got another tab down here called formula and this is where I'm going to put my formula. So first of all you've got your phases, your water phase, your oil phase, your cool down phase. If you need to add multiple phases you can add more. You can also add rows by clicking on the side here. You right click and uh, a menu comes up and you can select insert and it'll insert a row for you. Um, so what I've done is I have now separated everything out into their rightful phases and I've also done them in order of concentration, so highest first. To do this, I went to my workings tab and I just looked in my how to use and anything that I'd noted water soluble or water phase, I'd put in the water phase, anything oil soluble or oil phase, I'd put in the oil phase. 
um, and then cooldown phase was here. And then what this does is it just totals it all up to make sure you've got up to 100%. The water will be empty once you've input all of these and all you need to do is deduct the total of all of these from 100 to get what's left which will be your water assuming this is an aqueous product and then all of that should add up to 100%. Then all you need to do is calculate it based on the batch you want to make. Um, I have got another calculator on the website uh, that helps you do that. I've also done a video on how to calculate batch weights. If you want to watch that, I'll link that below. And that's all you do really. I suggest if you're making a dupe product, test in sort of 100 gram batches. That's small enough that you'll get to use it and test stability and check how it is, but also large enough that it's not fiddly with all the ingredients. And that's that's basically all there is to duping a product. It's about best guesses and just gathering all the information on the ingredients that you can to see how they work together. And just really think about the texture of the product and what these ingredients will do to affect that as well will also go towards determining how much you use. An example of that would be acetyl alcohol you don't want to be even though it can be used up to 25% and it's quite high up in your ingredients list you don't want to be saying oh okay so that must be used at about 20% because that would make an extremely thick product so just just think about it and if you want to get used to how ingredients perform you can also do little tests individually with them so Try adding acetyl alcohol to some little test products, make some lotions with acetyl alcohol at different percentages and see which one you like best. And, and that's kind of how do you get to know your ingredients and then duping products becomes much easier because you instantly know what these ingredients do at what sort of percentage. So I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions, then pop them below. Don't forget to download this free spreadsheet to help you out. Um, that's linked below and I'll see you in the next one.